Today we turn our attention to a letter from Paul. Uh, Paul, many of you will remember, is, uh, became a follower of Jesus after the, the resurrection. Uh, Jesus appeared to him on the road, and he became one of the greatest apostles, one of the greatest missionaries, and was shipwrecked and beaten and all sorts of different things. And, and as we read this letter today, I want you to remember that he's writing this letter from jail. As we think about the words of this letter, I just want that to be our background, our backdrop, because many of us would say we've got lots of things going on in life. Paul had lots of things going on in life, lots of struggles, lots of difficulties, and, and Paul understood, and in the midst of all of that, he pens these words that we find in Philippians chapter four. Hear this word this morning. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'll invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, as we open your word today, we pray that you would open our hearts, that we might experience the power of thankfulness, power of gratitude in each of our lives. God, open us up to what you have for us today. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is Thanksgiving Sunday, which means that this Thursday is the big day. And I know lots of planning has gone into this already in many of your lives. I've seen lots of lists of who's bringing what to our Thanksgiving meal. I'll head down to uh, Fayetteville on Thursday to eat with my brother and and the rest of my family. And poor Michelle is just along for the ride. Uh, Anytime Hildebrandts get together... It's unique. We'll just we'll we'll go with that. It's unique, and 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 you know the the Thanksgiving is supposed to be this wonderful time where we get together and we have these visions of family and and sharing stories and and a wonderful meal together. But sometimes, even the thought of that meal fills us with a little bit of anxiety, right? We think about the, the food that we have to prepare. We think about all the things that go into it. We think about how we're, we're trying to make a good impression on whoever it is that might be at this meal. We, we think about that table, the people around that table. And for many of us, as we think about those people that are going to sit around that table, we are filled with anxiety, right? Right? Because all of us can picture some of those people in our lives, some of those people in our family, and we're, we're a little worried. We're a little worried about what might be said, about what might be done, because all of us have that, that uncle, right? Uh, that, that one uncle that's, that lives in Idaho and only shows up at Thanksgiving. He like, lives in a bunker, and he, he's got lots of conspiracy theories about the way the world works, and, and, and you know, he shows up at Thanksgiving to, to propose all of these strange ideas, and everybody's like, who invited him? He just keeps showing up. Or, or maybe if you don't have that person around your table, maybe you've got the food critic. You know, the, the person who thinks that they ought to be on the Food Network judging other people, they think that they could beat Bobby Flay. <laughs> and they sit down at your table and they comment about your turkey and how it's a little bit dry. Have you thought about brining it for 24 hours before you cook it? Or, or, or maybe they have some real strong opinions about the way that sweet potatoes are supposed to be made. Who puts pecans and brown sugar and sweet potatoes. Everybody knows they need marshmallows <laughs> the way that the Lord intended it. <laughs> because if you can take a vegetable and turn it into dessert, congratulations. 
Somebody knows what I'm talking about. They comment about this and about that, and, and, and they've got s- certain thoughts on the food that was prepared, and, and inevitably, we don't make the right dessert, the, the one that they wanted, the one that they can't have Thanksgiving without. Or, or maybe you have the big announcement maker. You know that person in your family who decides all year long, I'm not going to talk to, to my, my parents or, 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 or my family about this big decision that I'm making, but they feel it's totally appropriate at Thanksgiving dinner with everyone gathered around to make this big reveal. Great news, everyone. I'm moving to Washington State to start a hemp farm. (laughs) What? Like, you wouldn't have that conversation before tonight? You laugh because you've been there. You've experienced that. There's that person that, you know, that one person that doesn't realize it's not okay to talk about politics at Thanksgiving dinner. And then, just so you'll know that I'm not on the outside of this looking in, my wife would tell you I am the worst of the worst of the worst because I'm the pot stirrer. I'm the one who pokes the bear. I'm the third of four kids in my family, which means uh, I was often left behind. I mean, literally, like they often left me behind. My mom would get in the car and be like, one, two, three, close enough. (laughs) 75% ain't bad, right? It's it's passing. This is is real story. Michelle and I drove from North Carolina to Florida to, uh, for Thanksgiving on, on college break one year. I pulled up in front of my childhood home, and in front of my childhood home, there's a sold sign, and there is nothing inside the house. <laughs> so we went to Michelle's parents' house on the other side of the lake, and I said, Bruce and Bev, do, do y'all know where my mom is? And they said, oh yeah, she moved. She didn't tell you? Clearly not. So I only have one recourse. I will poke the bear. If you want to propose a crazy conspiracy theory, I'm just going to keep feeding you the rock. Like, let, let's go one further. If you want to make a big announcement, I'm going to invite you to keep going. Tell us some more. Michelle loves going to family dinners with me. In fact, she'll watch this unfold. I've noticed she's got this tick. It's not really a tick. It's just her disapproving of whatever it is I'm about to say. Somebody will finish talking, and I'll open my mouth, and she's already shaking her head. She doesn't even know what I'm about to say. She already disapproves. She's probably right. What we learn is that holidays come with lots of joy and lots of fun and lots of family. They also come with a lot of anxiety, a lot of pressure, a lot of worry, a lot of concern, a lot of depression. In fact, a, a, a recent study showed that Americans say that they, they increase the, the level of anxiety and depression that they have about 25% during the holiday season. So from Thanksgiving till Christmas, that sense of anxiety and hopelessness rises in us. There's something about these holidays that are supposed to be a wonderful time of joy, a wonderful time of celebration that, that brings some anxiety with them, that brings some worry, that brings some doubt, that brings some pain in many of our lives. And with the holiday season now beginning in like October, when Walmart first puts out all the decorations, it's just a prolonged season. And before we rush past Thanksgiving and into Christmas, I think it's important for us to think about what Thanksgiving really invites us into. Beyond the great meals, beyond the football, beyond all of the the family gathering together, 
Thanksgiving invites us into something unique, an opportunity to pause. Paul says it, right? I mean, this is 2,000 years of wisdom. Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. This is Paul writing 2,000 years ago. He didn't have social media. He didn't have 24-hour news networks. He, what, what did he have to be anxious about? But here's Paul sitting in jail, writing to people who he knows he may be writing to for the last time, saying, don't be anxious about anything. Don't be full of worry and anxiety and dread and hopelessness. Easy for you to say, Paul, you don't know my family. Easy for you to say, Paul, you don't know my current situation, the reality that I live in day in and day out. Paul, that's, that's fine for you to say, don't worry about anything, that's great. How do you expect me to deal with that? And Paul, kindly enough, gives us a solution with everything. By prayer and thanksgiving. I've come to think of prayer a little bit different in my life over these years. You know, I, I used to think that, that prayer was this big flowery thing and you had to go off somewhere and you had to find a closet and, and get down in your closet. What, I, what I've come to realize is that prayer is really as simple as just a pause. Just that moment before something comes out of your mouth. And you hear this little voice in your head that says, don't say that. Or that moment before you say something in response to someone and your prayer is, God help me. We're invited to, to pause. To just leave a little bit of gap to remember something of prayer and thanksgiving, Paul says. This, this season has this name, we call it thanksgiving, but thanksgiving is more than just a meal, it's this sense of being that we're invited into. Paul invites us to, to be thankful, to be grateful people. Don't worry about anything, but with everything, by prayer and thanksgiving and the peace of God will guard your heart in Christ Jesus. Paul says the, the, the solution, the, the way to deal with all of those things that are going on, all of those things that are, are weighing on us, all of those worries that we have, whether this will be right or that will be right or whether we'll get it all done, or who's going to show up and what are they going to say? The way to deal with that is to, to learn to be grateful in all things. To pause and to be thankful. We've made this a regular practice in our house because we think it's important for our kids to learn this practice of gratitude. Oftentimes they assume that like we're just going to give them things because they're our kids which is kind of true, they're cute. But we want them to be grateful for the things that they have, for the opportunities that they have, for those moments that transcend stuff. And so we have this practice, especially during this season. Uh, we have a, a, this plastic white pumpkin. It's, it's a little bit smaller than this. And it sits on our, on our counter. And it's got all these words written around it. And what those words are, are things that our kids are thankful for. It's, it's a regular practice of gratitude in our house where we sit down and we express something and we write it down so that it's a visual reminder that no matter what's going on, no matter what tests they're worried about, no matter what's going on in their world with their friends or with, with their family or whatever it is, that there is this visual reminder of all of the things that we can be grateful for. And sure, there's some, some small things on there. I mean, they're grateful for their pet lizard and our pet dog, and I'm sure the duck will make it on there at some point. We have a pet duck. 
Don't know if you've heard me complain about that, but <laughs> gives me anxiety. <laughs> I'm thankful for the duck. <laughs> but there are also the important things on there. Some of you are on there by name. And even if you're not on there by name, this church is on our pumpkin because our kids are grateful for this place. In fact, I was looking at that pumpkin this last week and there's a, a series of words that I was reminded of because it was a year ago this last week that I got a phone call from our district superintendent saying, you're gonna be the new pastor at Lawrenceville First United Methodist Church. And so on our pumpkin it says, we're thankful for new opportunities. And I'm so thankful. I am so grateful for what God is doing in our midst and the opportunity just to be along for the ride. In my own personal life, I have this daily gratitude practice. I've got a little journal, and I'm not a journaler, okay? This is, it's, it's, it's literally called the Christian Gratitude Journal, and it's got a blank for each day where it says, today I am thankful for, and it only leaves you a little bit of space. So I don't have to come up with a lot of things. But it helps me to be reminded that no matter what else is going on, there is goodness and there is grace present in my life. That there are things in my world that I can be thankful for. Paul says, all things by prayer with thanksgiving. I, I love that like the social sciences are catching up to some of the truth that's held in the scriptures. Uh, these two Harvard researchers, Emmons and McCullough, did this study a couple of years ago about the, the practice of gratitude journals. They, they took a group and they said, you're going to write in this gratitude journal each and every day. You're going to write just one thing. That's all you need to write, one thing that you are grateful for. And then they had a control group that didn't write in the gratitude journal. And they, they watched them over time and they, they asked them lots of questions. And what they tended to find was this, that grateful people take better care of themselves they engage in better health practices like regular exercise, healthy diet, and going to the doctor. They showed that there's a tremendous positive value in helping people deal with their daily problems by writing in these journals, and especially with stress. One of the studies shows that there was a 53% decrease in the stress that these people said that they had who were writing in a gratitude journal each and every day. One of the studies showed that the, the people who kept the gratitude journal maintained a greater sense of optimism about the future and were 25% happier. Couldn't we all use to be 25% happier? I mean, I, I could definitely be 25% happier. That sounds great. They found that it was associated with better sleep and lower levels of anxiety and depression. There was more sense of determination, attention, enthusiasm, and energy compared to the other groups. Paul was on to something. With anxiety-related disorders so rampant in our culture, What a great time it is to pause and to be thankful. In the midst of it all, in the midst of everything that's going on, in the, in the, the, the anxiety that we have, the struggles that we have, gratitude does something for us. It unlocks a sense of joy in our lives that allows us to live a better life, to understand the peace of God a little bit more. Remember, that's what Paul says. Don't, don't be anxious about anything, but with everything, by prayer and thanksgiving, in the peace of God. This Greek word for peace is the equivalent of the Hebrew shalom, which is a sense of wholeness, where everything is put together. 
and the sense of peace that God is present with us even in the worst things, even in the hardest things, even at Thanksgiving. God is there. Remember Paul says, the Lord is near. Rejoice. Gratitude unlocks a sense of joy and fulfillment and wholeness that God longs for each of us to have. There's this Jesuit priest that says, it's not joy that makes us grateful, but it's gratitude that makes us joyful. Gratitude is not just about being polite. It's not just about saying thank you when somebody hands you something. It's so much more. It's a life lived the best possible way. Joy and peace are always a function of gratitude, and gratitude, it turns out, is always a function of perspective, that God is with us no matter what. And if we'll turn our attention to what God is doing and be grateful, it'll change the way we live. See, I think that real gratitude is a disciplined awareness and a trust in the presence and the goodness of God in our lives. It's a discipline, it's a practice. It's something that we can do day in and day out. And I think it changes our perspective on life. It changes our attitude towards life. It's like the great poet laureate Jimmy Buffett once said. (laughs) Didn't think you were going to hear that today, did you? (laughs) It's about changes in attitude, changes in latitude. Nothing remains quite the same. We'll take on the attitude of gratitude. Then we won't just respond to our circumstances. We'll begin to translate our circumstances through the lens of thankfulness. And we'll experience a peace. A peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Let's not rush past Thanksgiving this year, but let's pause in the midst of it with everything by prayer and thanksgiving so that we might experience a peace beyond all understanding. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we are so thankful. God, we're so thankful for the way that you show up in our lives each and every day. God, give us eyes to see where you're at work. God, help us to participate in this disciplined practice of noticing your goodness and your mercy in our lives. Let us see your grace. And let us be thankful. Let us practice gratitude as a a normal attitude of our lives so that our circumstances don't cause us anxiety, but instead we can have a peace in the midst of it, a peace that only comes from knowing you, knowing your son, Jesus Christ. God, we know you are here. Help us. Help us to be thankful that you are here. God, change our attitude to gratitude. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.